Most of what we understand about discipleship comes from what we read in the Bible. But Jesus didn't invent the word disciple. He wasn't the only great teacher to have disciples. He was the greatest teacher to ever have disciples, but the concept of discipleship wasn't something new. Aristotle had disciples. Plato had disciples. Before Paul converted to Christianity, he was a disciple of Gamaliel, who was the most revered Jewish lawyer of that time. The Greek word that's translated disciple meant learner or student, but it went beyond what someone would normally learn in a classroom setting. Those who really wanted to excel in those days wouldn't just attend school. They would attach themselves to someone who was very knowledgeable in whatever field they wanted to go into. Most great teachers had rooms or dormitories that they invited pupils to stay in. They would hold regular classes for their pupils. But most of the learning happened outside of the classroom. True disciples learned from observing how the teacher did things and how they responded to various situations. Their goal was not just to memorize theory, but to see how to apply it in everyday life. In essence, they wanted to become like their teacher. They said, I want to be exactly like you. So I am going to observe. I am going to follow. I am going to learn everything I can from you. They believed that their teacher was the best. And based upon that belief, they put their life completely under the authority of that teacher. That's why I said last week, believing is only the beginning. If we believe, we have to put our action into belief. If we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, we must stop trying to figure out another way or an alternative truth and start acting upon what we say we believe. James chapter 2, verse 17 says, Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. In John's gospel, we read the account of where Jesus' disciples came from. The first two of his disciples had first been disciples of John the Baptist. John chapter 1, verses 35 to 39 says, The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Now, this is where he had baptized Jesus. Jesus had come the day before and been baptized. And that's when John realized this man who was his cousin, Jesus was John's cousin. That's when he realized, hey, my cousin is the Messiah because he saw the Holy Ghost descend and said, this is my beloved son in, in whom I am well pleased. So the very next day, John was there, same place, with his disciples, and he saw Jesus passing by. And he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. They had been following John because they thought John was a great man, but now they met somebody greater than John. So they immediately left John and started following Jesus. They became a disciple of Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Basically, what they were asking is, where is your school? Where is your dormitory? We want to be part of your school. We want to move to your place because we want to learn from you. Jesus said, come and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Those two men were disciples of someone else. But when they met Jesus, they said, we're going to change our allegiance. We're going to start following this man. They didn't want to be trained by a second string player. So they believed what John said. When John said, that is the Messiah, there's the Lamb of God. They said, okay, if our teacher says this man is greater, then why would we follow this man? Let's follow the greater man. So they changed their allegiance. The question that they asked, well, I said that, where, they, where are you staying? Was Where is your school? Where can we come to learn from you? That brings me to point one of what it means to be a disciple. Point one, a disciple is a follower. A disciple doesn't lead. A disciple follows. A disciple doesn't do anything on his or her own authority. If the teacher asks them to do something, they do it because they don't set the agenda. They don't make the decisions. When the teacher says do something, they simply do it. We see the disciples of Jesus asking clarifying questions. Sometimes Jesus would say, do this, or he'd teach them something. They said, we don't understand. Can you explain this to us more fully? They'll ask clarifying questions, but they don't argue with the teacher. They are following that teacher because they believe the teacher knows best. Luke chapter 6, verse 40, says, The student is not above the teacher, 
but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. When we're fully trained, we will be like them. Until we're fully trained, we are a disciple. We are a learner. We are learning from them. That's going to lead us into next week because the next time we're a believer, then we become a disciple. After we've been discipled, we become a Christian. We become like our teacher. You're not automatically a Christian. Every day we should be more Christian than the day before because the word Christian means Christ-like. And as we're discipled, as we go through the discipleship process, each day we should become more and more like our teacher because it says everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So the question we need to ask ourselves, again, we'll get into some of this next week, is am I like my teacher? Am I like Jesus? What did Jesus do? How did Jesus talk? How did Jesus respond to situations? Do I always do what Jesus would do? If the answer to that is no, then you're not fully discipled yet. And really the answer is none of us are completely like Jesus. That's why it's a never-ending process. It keeps going. We, a disciple, becoming a disciple, we are always a disciple. We always need to keep following. We've never gotten to a place where we know it all. We need to keep being discipled so we become more and more like our teacher. So let's see what happened next. John, John chapter 1, verses 40 and 42. This is after they spent the day with Jesus. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Andrew believed his brother, and he put his faith into action, and he also became a disciple of Jesus. Now, this was not originally part of when I started thinking through this series and thinking this. This point here that I'm going to bring up right now was not originally part of it. As I started studying it this week, I said, you know, that is true. That is part of it. A disciple is first a follower, but a disciple is secondly, a disciple is a recruiter. Andrew went and got Peter, his brother, said, you need to come be, become a disciple of this man that I have become a disciple of. A true disciple or follower is so excited about the person they're following that they actively recruit other followers. If you're not bringing other people to Jesus, then you are not a true disciple. Because if we look at the Bible, disciples made disciples. Disciples brought other people. They were so excited. We found this man. You need to find him too. Come with me. I want to introduce you to this man that I am following. One of the commands that Jesus gave us was to go and make disciples. A true disciple always does what his teacher or master instructs him to do. So when Jesus said, go make more disciples, a true disciple would take that to heart and would do that. Let's continue on. Jump down to verse 43. It says, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. He, Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So here we see another new disciple, another new follower, so excited. He wanted to go out and get somebody else. So he goes out and finds somebody else, says, you've got to come follow this guy. I found the greatest teacher of all time. You need to be one of his disciples. Come with me. Meet him. You need to do what I'm doing. We don't use the word disciple much anymore, except when we're talking about disciples of Christ. I mean, we talk in the church, we hear the word disciple. People outside the church really don't even know what that word means. It's kind of become a church term. Back then, they knew disciple. Everybody had disciples. Now we use other words, like apprentice or intern. When I was doing children's ministry, I had a lot of interns. Those interns wanted to become children's pastors, and for some reason, I'm not sure why, for some reason, they thought I was the greatest children's pastor in the world. 
And so they said, can I intern with you? Can I be your intern? And they would come, and I had classes during the day where I'm teaching about children's ministries. They help with children's ministries, and I'd observe them, and I'd give them feedback. Okay, let's tweak this a little bit. Sometimes I say, okay, you watch me this week. You're going to see how I do it, and then you're going to try it next week. And so we were doing all this kind of stuff. Now, the best ones, they didn't just attend the classes and just help out on Sundays. The best ones, they actually, I had one intern. In fact, my first intern was going to Northwest University full-time. He also, outside of that, was working 35 hours a week at Safeway in order to pay his way through school. He wanted to be my intern, and he, any time he was not at school or at work, he was sitting in my office. He would bring his homework to my office and do his homework in my office because he wanted to hear my telephone conversations, see how I responded to people on the phone. He wanted to see how I actually did the preparation for the messages. He wanted to go with me when I went to dinner or when I went to lunch just so he could talk to me in the car and ask me questions. He said, the more time I spend with my teacher, the more I'm going to learn. He went on to become the, the children's ministry, Northwest Ministry Children's Director for over all children's ministries in the Northwest District. Sometimes people would move across state lines to learn from me. I was in California. I had people come from Washington to come down and they wanted to intern. Somebody said, if you want to learn children's ministry, you have to go intern with that person. That's who you want to be under. I'd start with one intern sometimes. When I moved to a new church, I'd only start with one. But pretty soon I'd have three or four or five because they're recruiting other people to come. Now, I'm not trying to brag on myself because there were people I was learning from. These people came to me. They said, this is the greatest guy. I want to learn from him. And I'm saying, no, I'm not the greatest guy. I'm learning from this person over here. Now, my mentors were usually long distance. I was on the phone with them or sending emails to them or something. I did, couldn't actually be there with them. But my guys think I'm the best. I'm going, no, you know what? I'm not. I'm still learning. I'm still a disciple of somebody else. I'm still learning from somebody. But I'd be happy to pass on to you what I know and help you get to at least this level. And then some of them got to my level and took it way beyond that. I started Taylor in some of his music skills. I started him playing bass when he was real young and started him a little bit on guitar, but his music skills have gone way beyond my ability. He's taken that beyond. And part of that was he found a better teacher than me, and he, he changed his, his uh, loyalties to somebody else, one of my interns who was better than I was in that area, and Taylor, Taylor learned from him. I bring that up to illustrate a point. I'm not trying to brag on myself, but I'm trying to illustrate a point. If we really believe that Jesus is the greatest person that ever walked this earth, and that we, we believe that he's worth following, shouldn't we be telling somebody else about him? That's what my interns did. They said, if you want to learn children's ministries, come learn from this guy. If we really believe that Jesus is worth learning from, why aren't we telling other people, you need to come learn from the person that I'm learning from? Maybe we don't really believe what we say we believe. Jesus' disciples were constantly bringing other people to Jesus because they were excited. It seems like too many believers today don't have that excitement. And not only are they not recruiting others, they're falling away themselves. At one time, they were excited, but the newness is worn off. They're just not excited anymore, and so they started falling by the wayside. I found this a few months ago, and I showed it to Caitlin, I said, one of these days I'm going to find out how to fit this into a sermon. I, I really love this, so I copied it, I put it on the side of my desk, I said, one of these days I'm going to find a sermon where I can fit this in. This is it. Ten little Christians standing in a line. One disliked the preacher. Then there were nine. Nine little Christians stayed up very late. One slept in on Sunday. Then there were eight. Eight little Christians on their way to heaven one took his own road, then there were seven. Seven little Christians chirping like some chicks. One disliked the song leader, then there were six. That obviously wasn't here at this church. Six little Christians seemed very much alive, but one lost his interest, then there were five. Five little Christians pulling for heaven's shore, but one stopped to rest, then there were four. Four little Christians, busy as a bee. One got her feelings hurt. Then there were three. Three little Christians knew not what to do. One couldn't forgive another. Then there were two. 
Two little Christians, our rhyme is nearly done, quarreled over petty stuff. Then there was only one. Pretty sad story, isn't it? One little Christian, can't do much, tis true. Brought his friend to Bible study. Then there were two. Two earnest Christians, each one, 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 one more. That doubled the number. Then there were four. Four sincere Christians worked very worked early and worked late. Each one another. Then there were eight. Eight splendid Christians. If they doubled as before, in just a few short weeks, we'd have 1,024. True disciples are excited. They're following. They're not finding ways to stop following. They're following and they're excited and they're bringing other people and other people are becoming followers too. A true disciple is a recruiter. The disciples of Muhammad are recruiters. The disciples of Buddha are recruiters. The disciples of Joseph Smith are recruiters. I could go on and on and on. In all the other religions, they're following somebody and they're recruiting other people to follow who they're following or be part of their religion. True disciples of Jesus Christ must be recruiters. They must be bringing other people. We're recruiters first because we're excited about the person we're following and want others to follow him too. Secondly, we're recruiters because Jesus commanded his disciples to make disciples. And a true disciple always does what his teacher asks him to do. Point three, a disciple is a learner. We don't become disciples because we know it all. We don't say, okay, I know it all, so I'm going to get around somebody else that knows it all. A disciple says, I don't know it all, so I want to learn from somebody who does know it all, or at least knows more than I do. In Jesus' case, he does know it all. In my case, when people are following me, I didn't know it all. Jesus' disciples didn't debate theology with him. When Jesus gave them instructions, they didn't say, now wait a minute, Jesus, let's talk about this. I think there might be a better way. Can we kind of talk about this? When Jesus said, do something, he said, yes, master, you know best, we will do it. They wanted to learn. Jesus didn't always tell them something they wanted to hear. Sometimes Jesus would rebuke them. Sometimes he'd challenge them. A big percentage of the things Jesus taught them went against everything they had ever been taught when they, while they were growing up. Jesus' teachings went against the culture of the day, and they went against human nature. Jesus was constantly saying, you have heard it said. This is the way you think it is. But let me say, I say to you, let me tell you the way it's really supposed to be. It wasn't things that everybody else was saying. Jesus was telling them something different. Never once do you read that one of the disciples confronted Jesus and said, you don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. You're out of touch with society. Jesus, you're living years ago. Things have changed, Jesus. You need to get up with the modern times. You don't understand. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And because they believed, they wanted to learn from him and hear what he had to say. John chapter 8, verse 31 says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. You can say you're a disciple, but if you're not listening to my teachings, if you're not doing what I say, then you're not really my disciple. If you hold to my teachings, you're my disciple. Hold to means hear, understand, and follow. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This book was written by our teacher. If we believe, we don't want to just listen. We want to do what we read. We want to do what we hear because we believe he has the answers. And so we're not going to argue. We're not going to debate. We're going to simply do it. A disciple is a learner. But a disciple isn't just a learner. Number four, a disciple is a doer. I've heard the words of my master. Now I'm going to do what he said to do. Too many people that call themselves believers can quote scripture like nobody's business. But they never do anything. They've got it all memorized, 
They can debate it. They can even teach it in a class. But they're not doing it. They know the Bible here. But they don't know it here. It's not in their heart. They're not doing it. A disciple is a learner. But they're also a doer. If you were here last Sunday night, I showed a little video clip that fit in kind of with last Sunday. Some of you weren't here, and even for those that were, I think you'd enjoy seeing it again because this illustrates the point we're talking about. A Christian doesn't just learn what his master says. A Christian does it. So let's watch this video clip once again. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. All right, most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. it, it Simon Says is, uh, you know, you just, Simon Says, pat your head, you know, so, okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus Says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. You, 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 you study it, you memorize You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do, when he tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in the, our churches are actually making disciples? But they memorized it. You know, when I tell my daughter, hey, hey, Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. <laughs> you said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> my friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and quote everything that he said and talk about how much we know. It's just, it's just this black and white stuff. If I just started with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. I would start making disciples. So many of us have been in church our whole lives. We can quote portions out of this book. We know what it says. We know what Jesus said. The question is, are we doing it? He doesn't want us just to memorize it. Are we doing what he said to do? A disciple is a doer. A disciple learns from his teacher and then imitates or practices what he has seen if we're not going to do what our teacher instructs us to do. Why are we wasting our time learning it? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus said, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, key word, practice, who hears them and practices, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Of course, the next verse says, he who hears these words and doesn't practice them is like the foolish man who built his house in the sand. See, we can have all the head knowledge we want. We can know what Jesus said. But if we're not doing it, it does us no good. We say we're smart, but we're foolish because we're not doing what our master told us to do. It isn't what we know that makes us wise. It's what we do that makes us wise. It isn't enough to simply be a believer. We must be a disciple. A disciple is a follower. A disciple is a recruiter. A disciple is a learner. And a disciple is a doer. All of us are disciples of someone. Whether you want to admit it or not, everybody here is learning from someone. Some people are learning from multiple people. You have several masters, and some of that's why we're so confused, because every day we're doing something different, depending on what our master of the day asks us to do that day. All of us are disciples of someone. We're all following someone. The question is, who are you following? Who are you learning from? Who are you imitating? And each of us, whether actively or passively, we're also recruiting others to follow whoever we're following. 
We're so excited about the person we're following, we're talking about them all the time, and other people are coming, joining us and following whoever it is we're following. Who are we recruiting people to? Are we recruiting them to Jesus Christ, or are we recruiting them to be disciples of someone else? All of us also have people following us, whether we like it or not. There are people that look up to you. Now, you may say, well, I never asked them to look up to me. It doesn't matter. They are looking up to you, especially if you're a parent. Your kids are looking up to you, at least at a certain age. There comes an age when they think mom and dad don't know anything anymore, and they want to do the opposite. But especially for younger kids, they're following mom and dad. They're learning. What are they learning from you? Who are you following? And if they follow you, will they end up where they need to be, or will they end up somewhere else? That's why Paul was able to say, follow me. As I follow Christ. Paul knew he, who he was following. He knew who he was a disciple of. He had full confidence that somebody else, because people couldn't see Jesus. A lot of people say, Jesus is way too far up there. I can't see him, but I can see Paul. I'm going to follow Paul. Paul said, you know, go ahead and follow me, because I know where I'm going. And if you follow me, I'm going to lead you to the right place. I say that I'm a believer. If I really believe that Jesus is who he said he was, why would I not follow him? Why would I not spend my time learning from him? If I'm not going to put what I learn into practice, then why should I even learn it in the first place? I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I am a disciple. Discipleship is a lifelong process. I will keep following I will keep listening, I will keep learning, and I will keep doing what my teacher and master, Jesus, says. Because I am not just a believer. I am a disciple. That's my declaration this morning. Hopefully that's your declaration too. I'm taking it beyond believing. I am going to become a full-fledged disciple. I will listen and I will do what my master tells me to do because he's the boss. I'm not. He knows what's best. I don't. I am a disciple. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't even taken that first step. Maybe this is the first time you've been in church. I don't know. There's some people here that I just met this morning. I don't know how often you've been in church. Maybe you're, you're still questioning all this. Okay, okay, I kind of believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I kind of believe all that kind of stuff. Well, you need to take that step, take it the next step. You need to actually put your faith and trust in and say, Jesus, I believe. I want to believe here, not just here. Let Jesus come inside your heart. But then we need to take it the next step. Say, Jesus, I believe. I've accepted you here. But I'm not completely following. I want to be a disciple. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, you see every heart in this room this morning. You know exactly where people are in their spiritual journey. I don't. I can see what they pretend to be in their spiritual journey. And there are people here who on Sundays, I would look at them and say, man, they're a great disciple. But I don't see them outside of this room. You do. You know whether or not they're really truly following. And in their hearts, they know too. I believe you're convicting some people this morning. You're pointing out areas in their life where they're trying to make the decisions. They know what you say. They've read it. They have it memorized. But they know they're not following through. They're not doing what they've memorized. Or not doing what they read. Some of them try to skip over those portions and don't even want to memorize it because they're afraid they'll come back to haunt them. You're speaking to people this morning and saying, you're a believer, but you're not a disciple. I pray that you would help us all to take that next step and become a true disciple. And Jesus, maybe there's a couple people here this morning who have not even taken that first step. They've not even thanked you for what you did on the cross. They haven't even asked for forgiveness for their sins. They're here this morning, maybe hearing kind of this gospel presentation for the first time. Lord, I pray that before this day is out, that you would let them open their hearts wide to you. They would take that next step and say, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Forgive me for all the bad things. that I'm, Forgive me for going my own direction. Up to this point, I haven't even cared to follow you, but I believe. And I want to put my trust in you. And then help them to become a fully devoted disciple, a full-fledged follower who will learn from you and do what you ask them to do. 
We love you, Jesus. Amen.